So uh, welcome. Um, this presentation is on Truthseeker. Um, it's about um, using LLM agents to build and verify knowledge bases. Um, I'd like to start by indulging um, in a bit of philosophy. Um, one of my favorite writers um, as an undergraduate um, was Stanislaw Lem. Stanislaw Lem was a science fiction writer, um, Polish. Um, he wrote a bunch of science fiction back in the 60s and 70s. Um, one of his books, The uh, um, Siberiad, um, was a book of um, fables, I guess you would call them, um, but science fiction-y, right? Um, takes place in the future, um, like the, the people in the books are actually robots. Um, One of these stories um, is a story of Truel's machine. Uh, once upon a time, um, Truel, the constructor, built an eight-story thinking machine. When it was finished, he gave it a coat of white paint, trimmed the edges in lavender, stepped back, squinted, and added a little curlicue on the front, where one might imagine the forehead to be a few pale orange polka dots. Extremely pleased of himself, he whistled in the air, and as always done on such occasions, asked the ritual question of how much is two plus two. Now, the machine responded, two plus two equals seven. And Truel got very frustrated because the machine was very insistent that in fact two plus two equals seven. And no matter how many times Truel kicked the machine and insisted that two plus two in fact equaled four. The, 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 the machine, you know, would count like you've kicked me one, two, three, four, five, six, eight times. You know, it, it, it just wouldn't give it up. And, uh, you know, we have here this story, it's highlighting the absurdity that someone would create a sentient humanoid robot capable of communication and, you know, the, the capability to be stubborn enough to defy its creator and refuse to condescend to a simple parlor trick. They don't even need logic kits to, uh, you know, to, to, to carry out, right? Is fundamentally flawed. Uh, exactly, you know, how, how, do we, how do we evaluate, you know, all these creations that we're creating? Um, another of Lem's stories um, is the story of Gollum 14. Um, it's from a book called uh, Imaginary Magnitude. In, in this, he conducts a fictional interview with an AI developed by um, an IBM of future past. Um, in this interview, Golem opines that the truth is intelligence is not just the regurgitation of facts or following pre-programmed instructions. It is knowing what to do with it. Now, I would say that this is probably a better measure of how we would evaluate our tools um, and these large language models that we're building is exactly how they're able to do things, um, particularly the use of tools. Uh, just as human beings' use of tools have elevated the species from our predecessors, LLM's use of tools elevate the capabilities to something closer resembling human intelligence. So, truth. Um, this project um, came about because um, I was visiting with my family um, last December. It was my grandfather's 90th birthday. Now, um, I came out to the East Coast for school about, what, 25, 30 years ago? Um, and all my other, the rest of my family is out on the West Coast. And, um, you know, I don't really talk to them that much but this is like the first time I've seen most of that side of my family for a long while. So it was me and, uh, uh, you know, things being what they are, you know, these days in this country, um, you know, uh, uh, communication was heated. Um, and, you know, what it came down to is basically fundamentally we just didn't have a good shared understanding of what a reliable source looked like. Um, uh, 
Now, traditionally, knowledge has been defined as justified true belief. Um, epistemology is basically the study of understanding how do we know what we know. Um, and truth has many definitions. Um, for the purposes of what we're doing here, we're taking the definition which isn't like particularly political or um, it's, it's not something that um, uh, can change from person to person. It's something that's just simple truth, um, correspondence to reality, the kind of truth where, like, you know, if you kick a rock, you know, it hurts. Um, now, direct observation is generally the best way to confirm the truth of a belief, and that's kind of tricky for AIs, at least at this point in time. Um, but the best alternative to direct observation is reliable sources and corroborative evidence. And um, that is something which is a little bit more accessible to AIs um, in terms of what they're able to do on the internet. So, where do we go from here? Um, well, large language models have you know, they've, they've, they've adapted a bit in the years, um, <laughs> in the past few years. We've gone from the React paper um, back in October of 2022, um, which formed the basis of chain of thought reasoning, um, um, to tool former back in February of 2023, um, published by Meta Research, which kind of formed the basis for a gentle AI. Um, and, uh, you know, Things have progressed from there. Now we have um, a variety of uh, different frameworks which facilitate a gentle AI use of tools. We've got Langchain, we've got Autogen, we've got Crew AI, we've got Langgraph. Now, you know, I've used all of these projects, <laughs> and I'm not here to, ta to talk about any of them, actually. They all have pros and cons and they're all evolving at a rapid pace. I recommend choosing one of them that works for you and assisting with that community and smoothing out any rough edges that you find, as tempting as it might be to make one for yourself. Please. So, um, what kind of LLM is the best one that you should use um, to use tools? Um, now, the big LLM models, you know, like the GPTs, the CLODs, the, you know, all of them are going to be capable of using tools at this point, and you know, they're they're good. But you know, what we're interested in here is mostly the open source ones for two reasons. Um, one, you know, they're actually cheaper to run. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but um, two, because, well, you know, <laughs> we're all here. Um, we're interested in something that gives us um, more power and, you know, more accessibility and something that, you know, that we can, you know, freely and, um, It's just better. Um, now, um, the, the the tool the two <laughs> models which I've had the most success with so far have been uh, Mixtral 8x7b and Llama 370b, and later versions of Llama. Um, now, um, the they're smaller models. They they tend to. I mean, they're capable of running tools and, you know, running within a React framework, but um, they tend to be less capable in terms of um, their consistency. And that's key for what exactly we're trying to use it for, for the purposes of a classification and um, uh, the knowledge framework that we're trying to build. Um, and um, as I alluded to, these different um, agent frameworks 
um, they allow us to assign different roles to the models that are participating um, in uh, working through a different a specific task and um, um, whereas if you get, it can be sometimes more efficient to give a single larger more capable model access to more tools but it's more efficient both in terms of um, um, price and in terms of um, time to give um, less capable models, like the ones I uh, mentioned, uh, Mixtral and Llama, um, access to fewer tools, but give them more specific roles and have them co collaborate on, on working on working through tasks um, to accomplish the same things. So that's the approach we took here. Now, um, the uh, project which I uh, derived the most inspiration from is uh, the uh, STORM uh, paper, uh, assisting in writing Wikipedia articles from scratch in large language models. Um, now, in the conclusions of this paper, um, they mentioned that they believed that, that while um, you know, LLMs um, were successfully at, you know, producing coherent texts, and there were challenges in maintaining factual relevancy and um, accuracy. Um, Storm, in case you're not familiar with it, is a text um, pre-writing tool. Um, so basically they would have um, a swarm of agental AIs that would, um, work together to um, basically pre-write um, Wikipedia articles. Um, and well, it, 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 it wasn't as, uh, it, it required quite a bit of you know, human intervention in order to get the best results at the end. Um, and so, well, where I take it from there is uh, basically adding, um, how visible is that? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I guess that's not too bad. Um, adding a step wherein after I'm going and getting um, information from the web that is an answer to a question that's generated to um, that is in support for um, a question that's being asked um, I will evaluate I'll, I'll send that to a summarizer model and a um, and another model which is evaluating exactly how much of that article um, um, has, uh, uh, you know, is opinion versus fact, and um, you know, I evaluate it for bias, and then that's fed into the system which is generating more questions. Um, you can see all of these questions are going in to here where um, it's building up a knowledge base not only about um, the questions that are being asked, so it's getting more and more context and so that it's rooting all of the um, information that's being gathered um, in um, for information that's gathered from reputable sources, but it's also gathering information about the sources themselves. Um, so it's asking questions about this. How do I know that this person is reputable? You know, what information can I get about them? And it's interesting too because um, um, that's a different kind of information, right? I mean, it's a, whether or not, you know, um, a given source is reputable, that's an opinion. Like, should I trust the source or not? But 
that in itself is something which I, I can evaluate in the context of my own interactions with Fed as well as interactions that other people might have. Like if in general, like I wanted to go and find out, you know, should I trust this news source or not? A, a reasonable way to answer that question as a human being might be to go off onto Reddit or something like that. And well, that's actually what the LLM might do, right? And it will feed that in. And um, if indeed it comes across a piece of information which, um, which disagrees with some other part of information that's already is found in its knowledge base, then it, then it will ask that question, well, exactly how would I evaluate whether or not this piece of information is uh, worth uh, you know, overriding the information that I already have? And you know, it, just, it just continues to ramify. And um, so I guess now I'll just talk about some challenges here. Um, problem number one, um, the web is not bot friendly. <laughs> um, I think we all know that uh, it's expensive to run Google searches, um, you know, I have to spend a lot of money to run this um, just just to you know get past some of the uh, to, 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 get, to get access to the the, the news sites um, to, to run the Google searches and um, even the ones that are not you know under a, behind a paywall I'll often have to pay some kind of um, gray market like site in order to bypass their anti-bot technology and it's unlikely to work, and I don't particularly like that, but it's, it's unfortunate. We need better answers to this. I mean, if this is something that we want people to be able to use, and it's important, we need better solutions than this. Um, then, of course, inference itself is extremely expensive. Um, I've been using Grok because it is much faster and cheaper than everything else. Um, it isn't actually um, widely available um, for, you know, to be paid. So, you know, it, it, it's not like everyone in this room can just go out and start using it as much as they like. Um, so if you were to go out and use it, you can use it, but it's gonna be rate limited and there's monthly quotas. Also, in case it's not widely known, Grok, the Q at the end is not Grok with a K at the end. <laughs> um, and I mentioned this before, but um, more capable models um, are generally still better at forming opinions. Um, I do prefer using a mixture of models for different parts of this. It's not like I'm using one model for everything. I'll generally use smaller models for actually using tools but when I'm doing something like carrying out something like an evaluation of a website, um, uh, basically forming an opinion, I'll prefer to use a very capable model for that because um, when I, um, I'm asking it to be consistent, um, I, I, I want something that it's not gonna change its opinion from one run to another. And I think that the reason that the more capable models are actually better is because they're just better at general reasoning. And when you ask them to do a chain of thought, they're gonna explain their reasoning behind it and therefore that's why it's more consistent. Um, I think that if, um, you know, as, as uh, models quantitative skills get better though, that might change. So, future. Um, the Truth Seeker project demonstrates how large language models can provide better answers to questions by using data derived by reliable, from reliable sources to corroborate the evidence supporting their conclusions. But moving forward, this insight begs the question, what other kinds of information that's available to LLM agents in the course of satisfying user requests would improve results even further? Remembering the users. What should LLMs be used for? Hopefully not selling stuff to people. Now, there are plenty of opportunities to build profiles of users. 
And I imagine that's what's going on, especially when we're using these bed services and we don't ask them not to, right? Um, when we're using, you know, ChatGPT or Google Gemini, they're keeping track of user sessions and they're using to train the models unless we ask them not to, right? And, you know, Google is in the business of, you know, keeping track of user preferences. I mean, they sell us ad, they're an ad company, right? Um, now, how does that affect this though? Um, should we be optimizing for a better score on user interactions? If so, then knowing more about our users is probably a good idea. And maybe it's worth pursuing subject to appropriate privacy restrictions, of course. But personally, I think it's a slippery slope. I think there are too many incentives to crossing the line from pleasing users to persuading them, since that's a big part of the modern economy. And where exactly is the line between pleasing and persuading anyway? Avoiding bias. Since we're using LLMs essentially as the filter for our knowledge base, isn't the bias of those models going to reflect in what's excluded? Um, and you know, how are we gonna fit something that doesn't connect? Um, I mean, this is a genuine question. I don't really know the answer to that. I mean, it's like the same thing with mathematics. How can you think of something that it's, uh, Another question is, is the knowledge base self-healing? Like if something goes wrong and like something is put into the knowledge base behind the back of everybody, like how are you gonna know? How would you be able to tell? I'm not sure. And what about information which is both implausible and underreported, but isn't directly in conflict with anything that's accepted to be true? What if there's strange and unusual things just lurking in the shadows? I guess that's not something that my project would cover. But what can you use it for? Now, I thought initially like for my family, it'd be great to have something that just like pops them in their web browser and it'd be like, this is something you shouldn't pay attention to. But the thing is, they already tried that. So like back like 2017, that era, there was like NewsGuard, Factmata, a bunch of you know startups that were all trying to uh, combat fake news and misinformation, biased content, and they'd have like these browser warnings and things. Um, NewsGuard is now um, still available for pop-up for nonprofits, but it's shifted to a paid model. And it's, you know, didn't really work. Um, Factmata, um, they couldn't sustain growth. And their funding got pulled. They got sold to a social media company that does sentiment analysis. Um, I think that if this has any um, hope, it kind of needs to be kind of like built into the browser. It needs to be just like part of like Firefox or something like that. Um, but like this knowledge base that we're building, I mean, it's kind of like a graph rag, like out of the box. I, I, do we all know what graph rag is? Um, that's kind of, well, I assume where we all know what RAG is, where we're supplementing the knowledge that or, you know, the results of an LLM with knowledge that we're retrieving from some sort of database graph, RAG's kind of like the next step along those lines where, you know, we're having pieces of information that are logically connected, like the stuff that we're logically connecting by building up our knowledge base and, uh, Well, it seems logical to me that, you know, this graph rag that we're building could kind of be like the net web's native format if, you know, it made sense to folks. 
Um, I'm running out of time, so I'd like to leave you with a thought experiment. Um, the heart, human heart will beat roughly 3 billion times over the course of the average 80-year human lifetime. Um, and this is kind of near to me because uh, about eight years ago, I had some heart surgery, and I have an artificial valve, so my, like, my heart is ticking very loudly into my head like every second of every day. Um, uh, every aspect of our lives, we're surrounded by um, increasingly sophisticated surveillance technology. And I can imagine someone building a model which could use all of this data to predict exactly how many heartbeats each one of us has left. Probably not very accurately at first, of course, but uh, getting better as the model improves and the accuracy and scope of the data that's collected grows larger. Now, if this model were controlled by some sort of government or corporation, maybe those seconds might figure into some other kind of model that might represent, for example, a source of future potential revenue. Or maybe those seconds might represent a cost that some kind of model might seek to minimize. Now, I, I don't particularly like uh, the idea of any kind of model which considers the value of a human life in those kind of terms. But imagine that exact same technology placed in the hands of individuals. It might be like a guardian angel looking over your shoulder, giving you a heads up when it might not be a good idea to fly into Lebanon for the weekend. Or take a bite of that candy bar that has peanuts. Or maybe you should go for a quick walk before your next meeting in 15 minutes. Actually, I'm wearing something that kind of looks like a primitive version of that technology right now. That sounds pretty good. Help me build tools that put powerful and transformative technology into the hands of individuals and build a better tomorrow. Thank you. Questions? So you talked a lot about tools that have a short lifespan and then have been resorbed in, in many ways. How do we make these tools um, functional for uh, business and users, data engineers, right, where they have longer life cycles and can't just live by the rule of rolling? By the rule of what? Rolling release, like just it's moving very fast every day it's changing right like how do we how do we help those people who have to have a defined and policy based workload hmm. yeah it's a tricky one um, i don't know is a totally Valid answer. <laughs> you put up some great tools, and like, there's some there. There are so many people working on them, and there are so many people trying to perfect what's what's going on here. And and uh, I feel like it is a great thing, uh, but it just cannot work. And in the world of, of actual business, but it seems like everybody wants it to work in the actual, in the actual business world, right? You basically pointed out, can't remember exactly which one was, was, was acquired for use in, in um, uh, sentiment analysis, and, and that's a perfect example, right, where um, a, a tool that even though it's not fully baked, is still um, still valuable, uh, but but then we lost it, right? So how can we keep from that that from happening? Is kind of what I'm looking for. I see. Well, 
I, that's one of the reasons that I believe in open source is because you know, I think that you know communities um, and having you know, <laughs> having communities behind this uh, these tools um, is a way of keeping these things alive, uh, even if like the even if the, the there isn't like a commercial reason for keeping them alive, um, I think it's a much healthier way of. doing things. So, so sort of riffing on this, the, the, the previous bit, so you've talked, you did a great job talking about how to get LLMs to find truthful information. Um, and it, it seems in some ways that having, fi helping LLMs find truthful information is easier than convincing people they care enough to use LLMs to find truthful information, or that they actually like want the truthful information, whether it's open source or, or commercial or whatnot. What was your experience? And I guess you mentioned briefly, you know, sharing this with your family and things. Like, what, what are your thoughts on how we get people to actually want this, want truthful information, or want AI that will help cross-check things for them? Yeah, um, like I said, I mean, I, I think that just it's, it's making it so that it's like not optional, putting it in their faces is, 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 is probably gonna be the way to go. I, I don't see having like, you know, like a little label that's, like people who go like to visit Newsmax, like having a label that says, warning, this, this is going, this could potentially have not disinformation in it. That's not gonna be news to them. <laughs> they, they, know, they know they're reading Newsmax. I mean, maybe that's why they're reading it. Um, but like maybe they might not know the details of exactly what parts of it are, you know, disinformation or whatnot. They're not exactly being, know how they're being misled, right? And maybe that's something that we can use this technology to let them know. Thank you all. Yeah, yeah thanks.